Hello, this is Kibo Cube Academy, Lecture 11, Introduction to Nanosatellite Structures. I am Hirak Sakamoto. I am an associate professor at the Department of Mechanical Engineering, Tokyo Institute of Technology in Japan. I have been studying space deployable structures, especially membrane deployable structures, and also developing a small spacecraft. I was a principal investigator for the three UCubeSat Origami Sat 1 launched in 2019. Today, I will use Origami Sat 1 as an example in the later half of this lecture. Today, after the introduction, I will cover eight important aspects of a nanosatellite structure design. Then I will talk about theories for structure design, including finite element analysis. I will also talk about vibration and shock test. By taking this one hour lecture, I hope you will obtain a good overview of structure design, analysis, fabrication, and the test in your nanosatellite project. As an introduction, let me first talk about what I believe structure engineers for nanosatellites should have in their mind. I hope that this talk clarifies the difference between the development of conventional large satellites and recent nanosatellite systems. Structure engineers primarily should find a design solution in the trade-off between mass versus strength and stiffness. Small mass and high strength and high stiffness are usually required. To achieve this, Structure engineers should be familiar with mechanics, dynamics, and material engineering. However, these are not enough in my opinion. When you develop structures, you will verify your design by analysis and the test. Then you will fabricate components and assemble them into the system. You will test the integrated system to see whether the satellite will achieve the mission and also satisfy the rocket interface mechanically and electrically. When the structure is integrated as a system, your structure affects the other subsystems significantly. This coupling is especially strong in nanosatellites because they are much smaller. So I believe that the structure of a nanosatellite is not a mere subsystem of the satellite. Actually, it is the representation of systems engineering required to build a good satellite. In this way, a structural engineer's responsibility is substantial. You need to be familiar with the entire satellite system. Therefore, let's first observe the spacecraft life cycle. This is typical mission life cycle of nanosatellites from the start of development to the end of operation. First, the development starts with a breadboard model, BBM. You design and verify it, and often this process is highly iterative. You will continuously update the design in CAD, computer-aided design, drawing and construct some mockups. The next step is producing an engineering model. You will make drawings for actual machining, carry out a structure analysis, and fabricate a real EM structure. You will carry out many tests. Then finally, you will construct a flight model and carry out acceptance tests. After this process, the satellite is launched, deployed, and operated to conduct mission in space. A spacecraft structure is its underlying body tasked with keeping the spacecraft suitably rigid to support its instruments and subsystems. This is true, but to achieve this, you have to consider all the interactions of the structure with the subsystems in a satellite during this long life cycle of the satellite. So how can we achieve it? Let me show you a typical design process for nanosatellite structures. The first step is to identify all the requirements and constraints. Then the satellite configuration is conceived. In this step, 
the basic architecture of the structure is determined, including the component placement. In this step, I highly recommend producing physical mockups using cardboard or a 3D printer. Doing so will significantly facilitate communication with other subsystems. Typically, you will make a three-dimensional CAD model using computer-aided design software. This model is gradually updated during the entire process of development. Based on this CAD model, you will carry out thermal analysis and finite element analysis to predict the natural frequencies of the structure. Basically, the primary structure supports or the major load path. The first structure model will be constructed. This may be a structure and a thermal model, which is a prototype of an engineering model, or the first structure model may be an actual engineering model. Here, please make an assembly procedure document to ensure the repeatability of the assembly. The structure will be assembled with other uh, subsystems and tested. Previously, I said natural frequencies of the structure are analyzed in the early development. This is because the natural frequency is one of the most important concepts for evaluating structures. Here, I am going to explain why. Let's consider this simplest vibration system. A mass M is, con uh, is connected to a spring whose spring constant is K. Then natural frequency of the system is the square root of K over M. Let me go over the derivation. The equation of motion of this vibration system is MX double dots, this is inertial force, and plus KX, this is spring force, equals to the external force F sub E. Now we assume the force and response to be harmonic. In other words, the external force is capital F times exponential J omega T, where capital F is a constant force amplitude. J is an imaginary number and T is time. Similarly, the displacement is capital X, which is a constant amplitude, multiplied by e to the j omega t. Please note that exponential j omega t corresponds to a single harmonic motion according to Euler's formula. Substituting these into the equation of motion, we get this equation, or capital X over capital F equals this value. This is called the compliance FRF frequency response function. Compliance means the ratio between the displacement and the applied force. As you can see in this FRF, when the excitation frequency is the square root of K over M, the denominator becomes zero. Thus, this magnitude becomes very large. This phenomenon is called resonance. Thus, the, this frequency value is important, and this is called the natural frequency. And with the natural frequency excitation, the vibration amplitude becomes large. Please watch out for the unit here. Small omega and capital omega both are angular frequency with the unit of radians per second. But the physical interpretation of this value is a bit difficult. Thus, in vibration testing, you will use frequency in hertz. Hertz shows how many periods in one second, which is easy to understand. Thus, you will use this uh, two pi conversion factor many times. I will tell you why natural frequencies of structures are so important for spacecraft design. For a spacecraft, the structure is often subject to acceleration instead of external force. Consider a rocket launch. The satellite is subject to 
subject to a large acceleration. So consider what happens when the constant acceleration A is applied to this mass. The mass will receive inertial load MA, and this causes the spring to elongate. The spring force is Kx. Considering the force balance, the displacement of X equals to M over K times A. Now the natural frequency is the square root of K over M. Thus the displacement equals A divided by the natural frequency squared. Thus when the disturbance is acceleration, the system's stiffness is better represented by natural frequency squared instead of the spring constant k. In fact, the spacecraft's stiffness is usually evaluated by natural frequency. This is why we usually have a requirement from a rocket, such as the lowest natural frequency shall be larger than 30 hertz or 100 hertz. Now I will cover some important topics in nanosatellite structures, and there are eight topics. First, the management of mass properties and dimensions is important for structure design. Especially the mass should be properly managed in tables and gradually shifted from a rough estimate to a highly accurate actual measurement during the development process the latest mass should be always traced. Initially, please keep a large mass margin, about 10%. This margin is necessary because if the mass exceeds the margin, there will be a risk of significant design change, such as reducing the stiffness and strength of the primary structure. There are also inertial properties consisting of center of mass location, moment of inertia, and the products of inertia. That should be also managed carefully, typically by 3D CAD. Actual measurements may be required. Finally, to ensure the dimension of your satellite, the structure should be as simple as possible. This enables high repeatability in the assembly accuracy spacecraft are often disassembled and reassembled frequently during the development process, so retaining an easy repeatable assembly is the key for keeping dimensions. The second topic is about rocket interfaces. Before and during the design of your structure, please check the interface control document with your launch vehicle carefully. As for mechanical interfaces, for example, surface roughness, strength, and coating of the structure is specified. For example, a CubeSat's rails are normally hard analyzed. ICDs will specify deployment detection switches, separation mechanisms, and venting. What is venting? During the launch, the internal volume of the air should safely evacuate through venting holes. This picture shows an umbilical connector for a CubeSat. This enables monitoring of the CubeSat from outside the deployment mechanism of the rocket. Obviously, the structure engineer should be aware of all of these requirements. So what will be the applied loads for your satellite B? The biggest contributor is launch loads. Launch loads are often categorized into four types with different frequency domains. First, there is the quasi-static acceleration load. This is the acceleration in the direction of flight caused by the engine thrust. This is about 10 G. Second, there is a sine vibration load. This is caused by the vibration of the rocket itself with a large peak at 10 to 30 hertz under 100 hertz. Third, there is a random vibration load. This is an acoustic load. The acoustic vibration from the engine jets are propagated from the mechanical interface between the rocket and the satellite. 
Additionally, in the atmosphere, acoustic loads are applied directly to your satellite through fairing. This has a wide frequency range and the acceleration value is typically large. Finally, there is a shock load. This shock is caused by explosion of pilot techniques to open rocket fairings and the separation of the spacecraft. The frequency is very high. As described by Professor Kuwahara's lecture, the keyboard cubes launch vehicle only specify random vibration and quasi-static acceleration. Loads are applied not only in the flight period, but also on the ground during development. Consideration of handling load on the ground is also important. Basically, you have to avoid undesired stress concentration. For example, you will add some handles on the satellite for ground transportation. When the satellite is suspended by handles, it inevitably causes concentrated loading at the handle attachments. So please check the safety factors. Usually, CubeSats are too small to attach such handles. In this case, you have to consider how you would hold the CubeSat to change the orientation during development. You will design and fabricate the support jig for various testing. Again, please consider how to rotate to various orientations and how to fix the jig. Solar cells on the satellite are very fragile, so usually you will make protective cover for solar cells. Please note that you will need some holes on satellites for the attachment of these covers. The design of a container for satellite transportation is also important. As an structure engineer, you not only design a satellite, but you also have to design how to transport your satellite safely. Next, thermal requirements affect the structure design significantly. To keep in an allowable temperature of the satellite instruments, you should properly design heat conduction and radiation. For conduction between the interfaces of the structure elements, there is an uncertainty of thermal contact resistance. So when improvement is required, you may use a heat conducting gap filler to reduce uncertainty. To control radiation, you will adjust surface absor absorptivity alpha and emissivity epsilon. Typically, you will apply a surface treatment or attach multi-layer insulation blankets. If the temperature range still exceeds the limit, you will consider the addition of heaters. You will also consider the effect of thermal deformation as a structural engineer. Thermal deformation causes thermal stress, so please be careful of the fatigue caused by thermal cycling. In addition, thermal deformation may degrade the alignment of your optical devices, for example. The alignment requirement should be satisfied even with thermal deformation. So you will conduct the thermal test using the structure and thermal model, STM, or an engineering model, EM. There are typically two kinds of thermal tests. First is the thermal balance test. The main purpose of this test is to co correlate the thermal mathematical model. This mathematical model will estimate the highest and lowest satellite thermal conditions. Secondly, the thermal vacuum test then verifies the satellite functions between the highest and lowest satellite temperatures. Another important topic in structure design is the selection of materials. Please find material properties from reliable documents. Use materials with good workability, easy for machining, and with high specific 
stiffness, and high specific strength. Considering these attributes, aluminum alloys are most commonly used. The 6061T6 alloy is slightly lower in strength, but easier to fabricate, while the 7075T6 material is desirable in terms of strength, stiffness, workability, and availability, but has a stress corrosion problem. Carbon composite materials have high specific stiffness and strength, but workability is usually poor. Titanium and tungsten are not recommended because they are difficult to melt during re-entry into the Earth's atmosphere. Most of the polymer materials are susceptible to atomic oxygen, AO, in low Earth orbit. So please be careful. In addition, be careful of contamination by outgassing. Due to a high vacuum and high temperature, gas is generated by some materials. This gas agglomerates on the surface of the instruments. This is called contamination. Contamination may cause degradation of optical devices or lowering the power generated by solar cells. For reference, JAXA's material database is available here. To reduce outgassing, we usually apply the bake out procedure before using a high spec thermal vacuum chamber. The next topic is fabrication and assembly. First of all, it is very important that you use as simple a structure as possible. A simple structure is easy to manufacture. So please specify in your drawing the dimensional tolerance and surface roughness. Fabricated parts always have a small dimension error. Please consider which dimension should be kept for precise assembly. Clean machining oil after fabrication to avoid contamination. Please consider storage methods of your parts during development to prevent scratches after machining. Scratches significantly degrade the surface roughness. There are commonly used surface treatments. The first is hard anodizing treatment. This forms a hard wear resistant oxide layer on the aluminum surface. This layer has non-conductive properties. The second is an allodyne treatment. This increases the corrosion resistance of aluminum alloys. The surface becomes conductive. And finally, MOS tube coating is often used for sliding parts as a solid lubrication. To facilitate your assembly of your spacecraft, please consider the accessibility of your parts. Does the design accommodate the assembly tools? And you may design and manufacture some zigs to assist assembly. And please create and update assembly procedure documents to improve reproducibility. Again, Simple assembly is desirable. As many subsystems as possible should be accessible after assembly. And subsystem replacement should be possible with minimal disassembly. This is a note regarding fasteners, which means bolts, nuts, washers. Please select uh, fasteners based on standards such as GIS or MIR. Tightening torques for each fastener shall be controlled by using a torque wrench torque driver. Please notice that improper tightening torque increases the risk of loosening or breakage. Please use any anti-losing measures, including spring washers, thread lock adhesive, double nuts, fixing the, with wires, pins, and other measures. Now, topic number seven, how will you analyze your structure? First, use a back of the envelope calculation as much as possible. 
This means that you have to familiar with theories. Secondly, FEM is a powerful tool and various commercial software is available. Here I want to point out that good structure design often facilitates analysis as well. Here are some tips. Please use simple shaped structure members. And each element should be designed to carry a single road path as much as possible. For example, this is an actual road member or a share only member. And the road path should be unique, independently determined by assembly conditions. Uncertainty significantly reduces the accuracy of the analysis. Please separate primary structure from secondary structure. Finally, structure analysis with gaps is difficult. The analysis is easier if the structure is rigidly fastened. The final topic is the test methods for your structure system. There are typically two kinds of tests. The first is design development tests. The purpose of these tests is to obtain technical data for design. Tests are often conducted for components and subsystems alone. We can achieve the following. First, evaluation of design feasibility. Second, validation of analysis methods. Third, establishment of test methods. And finally, clarification of failure modes. Another type of tests are qualification and acceptance tests. In the case of EM and FM development, the following are conducted. First, qualification test QT. This is a test under more severe conditions than a flight. This is to demonstrate that the satellite meets the requirement specification with an appropriate margin. For example, a square root two times the load is used for vibration test, or two times the number of shocks is applied for the shock test. Then there is the acceptance test, AT. The design has already been validated by QT, but the fabrication of the flight model has not been validated. Thus, the test is conducted under the conditions as expected in the flight to screen workmanship error. Now, I'm going to cover the very basics of various theories required for structural design. The first theory is the mechanics of materials. This page is about the elastic modulus and bending deformation. Please notice that there are three kinds of elastic modulus. First, let's consider a rod with the length of L subject to tensile force F. If we think a cross section orthogonal with length, we can define a stress sigma as F divided by A, where A is the cross sectional area. Then the elongation ratio is called a strain and there's a proportional relation between stress and strain. This proportional constant is called Young's modulus E. Then let's consider sharing deformation. Please consider the different cross section of the same rod like this. Then the force F is decomposed to the normal force and sharing force T. Shear stress is defined in this way. Then by considering the deformation of the square into a rhombic, the, ang the angle gamma is related to the displacement delta L. So this is a uh, shear strain. There's again a proportional relation between shear stress and shear strain. Here, G is called shear modulus of elastic elasticity. Then there's another property called Poisson's ratio. The length of this member is initially L. When you pull from the both sides, the length increases by delta L. At the same time, the length in the 
transverse direction decreases by delta A. The ratio between the elongating strain and the contracting strain is called Poisson's ratio nu. These three parameters, E, nu, G, are called elastic moduli. These often are found in the material catalog. These three parameters are not independent for isotropic materials. The shear modulus is represented by Young's modulus and Poisson's ratio, like this. Next, let's consider the deformation of a beam structure. The beam is long and slender element and has non-negligible stiffness in bending. The displacement W is uh, distributed along X. Then the second derivative of the displacement is proportional to the applied moment. And EI is called bending stiffness. This is Young's modulus E times the second moment of area I. The second moment of area I varies depending on the cross-sectional shape. For the rectangular cross-section, I is calculated as the width of the beam times the thickness of the beam cubed divided by 12. This power of three is important for structure design. If we want to increase the bending stiffness of your beam, increasing thickness is far more effective than increasing the length of the width. So knowledge in the mechanics of materials, such as yielding and fracture, is also important. For metallic materials, when you have a permanent strain of 0.2% remains, this is called yielding. Stress at this time is called proof stress. Then when the stress exceeds the tensile strength or ultimate stress, the material fractures. Another mode of material failure is called buckling. For a common structure, when it is in actual compression, a certain load called buckling load causes the deformation to jump into bending in the transverse direction. Normally, this is considered as a failure of the structure. The buckling load F is highly dependent on the boundary conditions of the column. When you have a free tip, the column buckles more easily than the other boundary conditions. So there are some failure modes, in, including yielding, fracture, and buckling. About yielding, we often use von Mises stress to evaluate the risk of yielding. In our 3D coordinate system, there are six stress parameters. Therefore, this one von Mises stress value is often used as a yielding index. Please note, it is always non-negative by definition. Finally, let's define the factor of safety and the margin of safety. These are important concepts for evaluating the strength of your spacecraft structure. So the proof stress and the, the actual stress in your current design should have a factor of safety more than one. The factor of safety of 1.25 to 1.5 is often used. Then the margin of safety is a convenient value. When you set the required factor of safety to be 1.5, for example, the margin of safety shows the margin to keep the required factor of safety. If the margin of safety is positive, it means you still have a margin in strength. Another important theory is the mechanics of vibration. I have already talked about resonance. Now I'm going to tell you that the vibration amplitude at resonance varies significantly depending on the damping ratio of your system. Now consider you have a single degree of freedom, DOF system, consisting of mass M, spring K, and damping C. This damping generates the damping force proportional to the velocity of the mass. 
the damping force is Cx dot. This is the equation of motion. Then, same as before, the harmonic force and response are assumed. Substitution of these gives uh, this equation and then this equation. Here we define the damping ratio, zeta, like this. Also, the natural frequency capital omega is used. Therefore, we now have a compliance frequency response function with damping effect. Please note that this is a complex number. Now, I want you to understand what a board plot is. This plot is usually used for vibration tests for spacecraft. It is a method to visualize the frequency response. As we saw in the previous page, the compliance frequency response function, FRF, is a complex number. It means that it has two dimensional information, so it can be visualized by two plots. One plot is gain. This shows the magnification of displacement amplitude for a unit input. Another plot is phase angle. This angle shows the difference in timing between input and output. Now the input is force and output is displacement. So there's a gain plot and a phase plot. In this board plot, the horizontal axis is a small omega over capital omega. This means that the excitation frequency is normalized by the natural frequency of the system in this plot. In addition, the horizontal axis uses logarithmic scale. This enables us to show the wide frequency range. The vertical axis of the gain plot is also in logarithmic scale. The unit decibel is often used. Please notice that the gain value rapidly increases near the resonance frequency. Small omega equals capital omega. When the damping ratio is small, we have a large displacement amplitude at the resonance. As the damping ratio increases from zero to one, the peak becomes lower and lower. This is the effect of damping in the system. The vertical axis of the phase angle is normally in linear scale. You can also see the clear effect of the damping in phase plot. So far, we have discussed the vibration system with only one mass. This is called single degree of freedom or 1D OF system. An actual spacecraft structure has many degrees of freedom. So now we consider the multi-DOF vibration system. You will see that the multi-DOF system can be represented by the superposition of single DOF systems. So how many do you think are the natural frequency for the two DOF system in this figure? There are two masses and uh, they move only in X direction. So this is 2DOF system. And it has two natural frequencies, as you will see. If there is no damping, the equation of motion is written like this. Now let's obtain the natural frequency of this 2DOF system. When the external forces are zero, the matrix representation of the equation of motion is this. Assuming a harmonic solution, it is uh, like this. The condition to have a non-zero displacement solution is, from the knowledge of linear algebra, the determinant of this part being zero. This is a two by two matrix, by the way. As you may have noticed, this is actually the eigenvalue problem of the two by two matrix. It is clear if we write it like in this equation, the matrix A times a vector X equals a scalar value times a vector X. Thus, there are usually two eigenvalues. Two eigenvalues correspond to two natural frequencies squared, capital omega sub one and capital omega sub two. 
Okay, I'm going to show that the multi DOF system is represented by the superposition of a single DOF system. Why? Actually, each vibration mode in multi DOF system can be considered as a one DOF system. So we also have two eigenvectors, phi sub one and phi sub two. These are called vibration mode shape here. So let's make the matrix capital phi. This is a four by four matrix. Using this matrix and applying proper scaling, we can diag diagonalize the equation of motion. In other words, we have a coordinate transformation matrix. The capital psi is a properly normalized four by four matrix and transforms coordinate between x sub a and x sub b into a c sub a and c sub t coordinate. This c coordinate is called a modal coordinate. By this coordinate transformation, the equation of motion is completely decoupled into two separated equations c sub 1's equation and c sub 2's equation. These are both single DOF system equations. So we had two DOF, so we have got two equations. The same is true for the general NDOF system. As a consequence, the compliance frequency response function for an NDOF system is obtained by adding the single DOF systems FRF n times. It can be calculated as the superposition of n single DOF systems. Let's now consider the dynamics of solid or continuum structure. In the spacecraft structures, the mass is normally distributed throughout the structure. It does not consist of a series of distributed masses connected by springs and dampers, but still we can use the knowledge discussed so far. The equation of motion for a continuum, for example, a beam is a partial differential equation. And similarly as before, natural frequencies and mode shapes represent vibrational characteristics. Now the beam is along the x-axis and the bending displacement is w. And the rho is density and a is the cross-sectional area. Then this partial differential equation is the equation of motion of the beam in bending. In this case, there are theoretically an infinite number of vibration modes. Assume the mode shapes to have this form, then the natural frequencies are obtained by applying boundary conditions in the equation of motion. For cantilever beam with uniform cross-sectional area, the natural frequencies and vibration mode shapes are as shown in the right. So this is the first natural frequency and this is the first mode shape of the cantilever beam. So this is second and this is third, and theoretically, there are infinite modes. So let me now move on to the finite element analysis. Consideration of an infinite number of modes is usually not necessary for spacecraft design. So let's approximate solid mechanics using the finite element method, FEM. FEM gives you an approximate solution for the partial differential equation. In our structure analysis, displacements at discretized nodes are interpreted by shape functions, as you will see here. So I will continuously use the beam example. Now we consider a static case or the case in which there is no inertial force. Then for the tip loading case, the general solution of displacement can be written in this form. So let's consider the displacement and rotation angles at the two edges of the beam. We consider that these are two nodes and this is node, node one and this is node two. From now on, the second subscript shows node number one and two. 
displacement solution can be expressed by nodal displacement and rotation angles at the two nodes as in this equation for w equals n rho vector times a delta a column vector this capital n is called a shape function as a result displacement at an orbitary location in the beam is now expressed by a displacement vector at two nodes so this simple beam example shows the concept of fem now substituting w into the static force equation we get this or f equals capital k matrix times a vector delta and this k is called stiffness matrix thus now if external forces and moments are given displacement can be solved by the stiffness matrix similarly the mass matrix and the damping matrix are obtained using the same function to get this entire equation of motion thus dynamic responses are also calculated by fem so far we have used beam elements with rotational angles as variables there are two modeling approaches to represent the rotational deformation of solid structure one is using an element with rotational dof like beam element for 3d analysis one node has six dof three translations xyz and three rotations another approach is using element without rotational dof like plain stress element solid element and discretize making nodes in the thickness direction as well in this case one node has only three dof translation in x y z but you will need more nodes you will choose either approach depending on your needs in fem here i show the general analysis procedure of fem using commercial software first import the shape data of the structure from 3d cad and create nodes to divide into elements or mesh generation and adjust shape elements and mesh according to analysis purpose there are three tips so first uh, maintain the aspect ratio of elements as low as possible and second minimize the number of dof to reduce computational time for example changing to a simpler shape third please use finer mesh where stress concentration occurs then input material properties and set boundary conditions for displacement and set external forces these are force boundary conditions then the software will conduct these automatically so the stiffness mass and damping matrices are generated for each element the matrix are assembled at shared nodes boundary conditions are applied to the matrix the matrix equations are solved and stresses in each element are obtained from the obtained displacements and finally you are ready for the visualization of results i'm going to show the finite element analysis results for 3u cubesat origami sat 1 as an example a theme analysis was conducted by using femap with fx nastran you will be able to conduct a similar analysis using other fem software there are many kinds anyway in this analysis we tried to simplify the model as follows first basically plate elements with rotational dof are used instead of solid elements without rotational dof this reduces the number of elements and second rigid body elements are used to model large components and point mass elements are used to model small components if it is not a primary structure you can simplify like this and finally for ports beam elements are used instead of solid elements as a result the calculations were significantly fast but generating a model requires significant effort so the structure design of this cubesat 
was verified by two kinds of analyses. The first one is the modal vibration analysis. We confirmed that the first natural frequency was sufficiently high and that the vibration mode shapes were reasonable. And finally, after the EM vibration test, a model correlations were conducted to match the first natural frequency. The model was tuned based on the vibration test results. The second is a stress analysis under constant acceleration. So we calculated four Mises stress by applying acceleration with a QT load factor. It is the sum of quasi-static acceleration and acceleration by sine vibration. These were specified in the rocket interface control document. Then we could verify that all the margins of safety are positive. Here the safety factors of 1.25 for yield stress and 1.5 for ultimate stress were used. Next, random vibration is converted to a static acceleration by Miles equation and a stress analysis was conducted. And again, the margins of safety in all the members were confirmed to be positive. This is one of the results of stress analysis. So we predicted four Mises stress in bolts in this case. So this is the maximum stress induced by external force plus plus stress. So this value is compared with the yield stress of the uh, stainless steel. Then again, the margin of safety was confirmed to be positive. Now I will talk about the vibration test and the shock test. These are the pictures of vibration test for the three CubeSat OrganiSat 1. This was acceptance test and there are accelerometers. The satellite is shaken on the horizontal bench and the vertical bench on the electromagnetic shaker. In this CubeSat, the vertical axis is Y, so X and Z directions are tested on the horizontal bench. Typically, the vibration test is conducted in the manner of two horizontal direction tests and one vertical direction test. We test each axis one by one. First, this is uh, X direction. There is a model survey test and sign burst test and model survey, sign vibration and model survey, random vibration and model survey again in the end. So there are four kinds of tests. You may be wondering what a model survey is. This is conducted before and after each test. This is to evaluate these vibration characteristics. The test uses low level random excitation. So you can see the natural frequency, mode shape and mode damping by observing the bold plot of the uh, frequency response. The horizontal axis is frequency, and this is the gain plot, and this is phase. This peak shows the first natural frequency of the satellite. So in the modal survey, it is important to find any changes in the natural frequencies. The change in natural frequency indicates the change in stiffness of the structure. This may indicate the structure failure so be sure to observe the change in frequency response between each test. So in a sign burst test, quasi-static acceleration is simulated by a sine wave excitation with a constant very low frequency. And in the sine vibration test, we sweep sine waves. This means we gradually change the excitation frequency of the sine wave. This is to simulate the excitation by the rocket vibration. And typically frequency is lower than 100 Hertz. And finally, a random vibration, the acoustic load is simulated by random excitation. The required profile is given by the rocket. The level is high and the frequency is wide from low to high up to 2000 Hertz. 
So during these vibration tests, please check all the procedures and the results. And after the test, we carefully inspect the satellite. Some launch vehicles require you to conduct a shock test. This shows the qualification test using an engineering model during the development of Organisat 1. Shock conditions are generally evaluated using a shock response spectrum, SRS. So you apply shock on the jig. In this test, QT shocks had to be applied more than twice. So let me conclude my lecture. So I have been talking about the same thing again and again in this lecture. The structure of a nanosatellite should be designed with careful consideration of the entire life cycle of the system. The structure is the key to facilitating the development of your satellite and therefore to making your mission successful. So good luck. Thank you very much.